about uh, panel discussion is to uh, get uh, your feedback um, about um, the future uh, for the, uh, of skip monitoring, uh, you know, skip treatment, what are the, the biggest uh, challenges uh, in the field. Uh, so we are going to keep it short uh, because we are a bit late. Uh, so I, I, I would like to to, to have your, your opinion um, about, um, uh, to start about the, uh, the monitoring aspect uh, of SIP because we, we saw a lot of SIP tracker uh, on the market with Jobo and Fitbit and all uh, kind of um, indirect measure of SIP. Uh, and I, uh, what do you think about the, uh, the minimum uh, kind of sensor and physiological signals that we should uh, embed in a system, uh, amb ambulatory system, for example. So maybe you can I think that you've il illustrated the fact that there are many devices out there, <coughs> but invariably they don't work. Um, and so, so many talks I give, people come up to me afterwards and say, you know, I don't get any slow wave sleep, or I, you know, I, I, all these other sorts of parameters. And I think this can be profoundly and deeply misleading. And why I'm excited to be associated with Dream is that you guys have got the first device that is genuinely measuring sleep and its various dynamic forms uh, in the home environment over long periods of time, um, rather than, as you were saying, bringing people into a sleep lab and getting this snapshot. So I think once we have a really reliable phenotype of sleep, we can start to um, <clears throat> look at therapeutic interventions on sleep and also have an appropriate diagnostic of sleep. And we have, frankly, neither at the moment, unless you go into a sleep lab and the sleep lab has all the problems of certainly in the psychiatric field, it's not well tolerated by people with psychiatric problems. So I'm really excited. Yeah, just, just to uh, add to this, I think uh, it's very clear that 90% of the device out there that you have, they all m work on the same principle. It's called a triaxial accelerometer. It's basically X, Y, Z, three little springs, and it exactly costs $1. Uh, actually, it's between 0.6 and $1.5 retail, okay? And basically, it's this little spring, you move them around, and then they give you a signal of movement. So, okay, of course, movement is correlated with sleep. You move only when you're awake. But the problem is you can be still awake. If you are lying down and you don't move, it looks like sleep. So the biggest problem of all these devices is they really don't distinguish between being awake and not moving and being sleeping. So that's the first problem. And the second problem is, I mean, I, I'm a strong believer that the brain wave aspect, which is EEG, is a richer signal, you know, for, you know, brain activity, uh, not only for sleep, but also for all kind of other brain conditions. We already know that uh, certain waves, you know, during sleep are being altered during many diseases. And I think it's just the beginning of a much bigger research. So I think uh, not measuring the EEG, to answer your question, I. I have a big bias, and that's why I'm excited, is that EEG is really, I think, critical when we want to measure a small period of time when you wake up and really what's happening. I mean, the other technology will never work. Uh, now, the second aspect is breathing, because sleep apnea is very common. And for breathing, there are, there are several alternatives. So I, I couldn't really tell what would be the best marker. Uh, you know, I, I think there are many. Maybe Rafael can yeah. comment on breathing. But uh, that's the second thing that's very important to have a good monitoring of because of sleep apnea. I think you're completely right. Uh, we sleep with our brain, not with our wrist. And this is the, the, the main thing. And many people come to me and say, OK, look at what my cell phone said when it was placed on the mattress or what my Fitbit says. But OK, it's your brain. It's not your, 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 your wrist that will sleep. And this makes a huge difference. We made a small study for, for a TV show when we, we had people with the these, these accelerometers and the, the polysomnography, and there was a huge difference, especially in insomniac patients. When people just go to bed, sleep for seven hours, and get out of bed, it was pretty accurate. But when people had, had uh, insomnia, it was completely wrong. So I think DREAM is a much better approach than, than these devices. Now, regarding sleep apnea, then we could make the opposite argument, saying, OK, we need to, to measure breathing. So it's a huge challenge now to be able to do something reliable 
with DREAM in order to measure uh, sleep apnea, to really predict the presence of sleep apnea, because it's more indirect than, maybe if we can have really the, 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 the saturation, then we would have a direct signal, but it's gonna be a very interesting challenge. And in terms of, at the other end, uh, developing new therapeutics, and of course, you can only tell the efficacy of those new therapeutics if you've got a, a decent device to measure uh, the efficacy, which is, again, why I'm interested in, in DREAM. But what we're trying to do is use our mechanistic understanding of how light interacts with the clockwork to provide a pharmacological mimic for light, to fool the brain into thinking it's seen light so it can stabilize sleep-wake profiles. And, and of course, that relates to individuals who've lost their eyes as a result of war trauma or whatever. And so we are using our understanding of mechanisms to regulate the sleep-wake cycle of individuals who have no eyes. But we want to use a device like DREAM to measure the efficacy of those drugs. Maybe to have a few words, so thank you for, uh, for the ideas on, on the topics, but uh, to just to clarify a bit the vision, so we are talking a lot about monitoring, uh, which I think is at the foundation of understanding sleep and, and of course acting on it. What we have been focusing is trying to find ways and methods to help certain type of poor sleeper to sleep better. And we understood rapidly when we launched the product that one key element of that was to try to segment the type of sleepers. Because when someone feel uh, tired during the day, uh, it doesn't know uh, uh, always uh, where this problem is coming from. And for example, you have 85% of people that are suffering from sleep apnea that doesn't know they are sleeping, they are suffering from sleep apnea. And they are not always going to a sleep center to get tested. So if in the coming months, coming years, uh, I'm not going to spoil everything, but we are successful in trying to say to people, you might have sleep apnea at least, a high probability of having sleep apnea. We can potentially uh, save s some of them on, on this particular topic. So really in, in, in the way we are conceiving the product, we really see like this first, and this is why we need your help on that, this first onboarding period with the product where we can play with all the data. Yes, we have less accuracy and less depth in the information than the full polysomnography. But as uh, everyone explained with this idea of longitudinal study, we can potentially find patterns. And we want to invest deeply in not only in the methods and the intervention for the user, but also the understanding of sleep, so that we can potentially see patterns of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, depression, sleep apnea, so that we can really be efficient on the second stage, uh, which is about helping sleep better. So we didn't talk a lot about that tonight, but uh, regarding chronic insomnia, it's pretty well known that cognitive behavioral therapy is a good way of helping people if we exclude short sleepers, or insomnia due to other diseases that have a true impact on their sleep. Uh, and so this is something that we'll be focusing on. Uh, the stimulation, we didn't talk that much about that because it's, it's a topic that is pretty new and we need, we need more studies and more validation on specific segments. But what we believe is sleep stimulation, for example, is not the recommended method for chronic insomnia, but rather for people that have a good sleep, but chronic sleep deprivation or chronic sleep debt, and we can potentially help them on optimizing their sleep. So uh, we really need to have a lot of data analysis and machine learning research to segment the population based on the data uh, and try to find some good mix of existing methods on CBT or biofeedback, neurofeedback, brain stimulation that could help them sleep better. So thanks for being here, for helping us on that. Yeah, no, for topic. sure, I think uh, everyone agrees that we need to move out sleep from the doctor to the home as much as we can. I mean, we sleep at home, we don't sleep with the doctor. So, you know, if we well, really want to, no, but I'm a sleep doctor too. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I believe that if you increase the pyramid of people, you know, it's not like we're looking for a job. I mean, <laughs> believe me, we, we just have plenty of work. So even if like, if everyone with sleep apnea was diagnosed tomorrow, we'll be overwhelmed. I mean, we wouldn't even know what to do. So uh, I think it's, it's, uh, we have to find solutions that are applicable in, at a home and much easier than going to specialists like us. There's absolutely no doubt about that. 
the interesting aspect of DREAM is that if you have a CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, you can also have a feedback on the improvement of your sleep. And I think this is very valuable for the people to see, okay, I'm doing these efforts to concentrate my sleep, but is my sleep improving or not? And if DREAM can give a feedback, it will encourage people to go on with the therapy. I think this is a very important point. Yeah. Because one key element that we don't really say is the fact that what is extremely hard with sleep is you have a lot of potential causes. It's correlated with a lot of things in your lifestyle and your general health. Uh, but you need to have a very extremely individualized approach when, when, when you, you work on sleep because everyone's sleep is different. Everyone's lifestyle is different. So when through the mobile app someone can say the activity he has been doing during the day or the sport he has been doing or what it feels and give feedback, then we can more and more individualize uh, the content we display in the C because CBT, general CBT is about educating people and, and some uh, basic techniques, but maybe we can you know, individualize and personalize this particular content and techniques based on the data, not only generated from Dream, but given by the users through feedback in, in the app. Yes, one, I would like to, to add one uh, important thing about the, the validation aspect uh, of such device. Uh, so, we, so we did a clinical validation for the beta version, so it wasn't, it wasn't perfect. Uh, so we, we are running um, a new validation studies, so in, in the US and in, in, in France. I think it's a good setting uh, to, to see, um, you know, with a polysomnography recording uh, at the same time with a dream recording. Um, you can see if you are able to detect sleep apnea, for example, but also uh, periodic uh, leg movements uh, with associated with uh, uh, micro uh, arousals. So, um, but it's, we, 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 we see in, in practically that it's complicated because it's really different between the population. So we, with the, the sleep of a sleep apnea patient is really different compared to insomnia or to, or to someone with uh, hypersomnia, for example. So if we had the opportunity to, 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 to only had, add uh, two, two sensors to, to record uh, physiological signals, uh, only, only two. <laughs> um, what um, are they going to be? <laughs> yeah, my, my opinion is sound is one of them because you can listen to the body and snoring. I mean, you have all heard that it's not very silent. And, uh, you know, I think you could monitor breathing at least even, even stopping breathing even without snoring uh, if you have really sensitive microphones which exist. And then uh, maybe some just basic accelerometers for legs. But then the EG, I think, is really indispensable. One other thing I wanted to mention about the EEG, which I feel very strongly, is again, uh, we, everyone forgets about REM sleep. I mean, we have two types of sleep. We have this slow wave sleep, you know, which we know is very important, but we also have the dreaming sleep, the REM sleep. And there is no way to differentiate REM sleep and non-REM sleep with any other method that measuring EEG, uh, pretty much. I mean, it's very difficult. And uh, especially differentiating from wake. So, and I'm, there is a lot of reason to believe that dreaming and REM sleep, I mentioned nightmares for, for suicide, but you know, we know that REM sleep deprivation has an antidepressant effect. I mean, you know that REM sleep is also very, very important. And it's not very much studied, simply because it's harder to study. And this will give us a lot more opportunity. And I think that's going to be very important too. I think sound is very interesting. There is some machine learning studies showing that you can really predict the presence of sleep apnea based on, on the breathing sounds. So this could be a good option. And also an oximeter. I know it's a bit challenging, but uh, to have a good oximeter could really be really helpful because we are currently studying which part of the apnea is a problem. Is it the awakening at the end, the stress associated with the awakening, or is it the oxygen decrease during and at the end of the apnea? Is it the lack of oxygen, oxygen deficit, or is it the, 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 the repeated awakening that generates stress? And it's possible that it's, it could be mainly that the time you spend with low oxygen level that will associate cardiovascular disease with the sleep apnea. So probably this would be an interesting uh, parameters to add. 
Uh, well, I would echo, yes, EEG and sound, I think, are the key parameters to measure. But I think what you've also got is a platform to measure other environmental uh, factors that will influence sleep. So uh, my bid would be for a device later on that can measure light exposure because light at dusk delays the clock, makes us get up later, and light at dawn advances the clock, makes us get up earlier, by one's light exposure, you can very much influence your sleep-wake timing. And I think it would be immensely useful, for example, in teenagers uh, or young people, uh, to, to, to assess how much light and when they get it uh, to influence um, their sleep-wake timing. I mean, that kind of knowledge could then feed back into some sort of app which would say, hang on, you've had a lot of evening exposure, you need to compensate that with a lot of morning light exposure. So I think what's exciting is you have a platform that could, that could be used to integrate multiple biological measures, but also how the environment interacts with that biology. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I, I think that these are like very, very interesting uh, ways uh, and, and things to look at. So the thing is, as a company, we are uh, doing a trade-off. Yeah. Uh, so it's about the cost and it's about the size, mostly the size uh, and, and the comfort of the device. So uh, we, we have this idea of uh, see, see how we can uh, efficiently, from a cost and volume perspective, add sensors, like environmental sensors, if it can fit on the headband or if it, sh it should be an accessory which is plugged to the headband and if it's an accessory uh, how much people are going to pay for it is it included in the price and thing like that uh, but definitely the goal is really to be to go as broad as possible in terms of sensors I even though we, we we have already things that we know about sounds and light monitoring that are interesting uh, also our belief at dream is um, if we can put many sensors we might learn new things uh, by running new machine learning analysis on these long longitudinal studies that we don't know yet. Uh, so we are trying to do that as much as possible, but by, by, by thinking about the comfort, the size, the volume, the, the, the power consumption of the device. Uh, uh, and of course, we're not going to talk about product announcement, uh, which, which are not yet announced, but uh, uh, it may be very interesting ideas. Merci, thank you. I think we, we are good. Yeah? Thank you. <laughs> so we have a, a small drink, Damien, which is... I have a question for the audience. Ah, yes, question for the audience. First of all, thank you very much for this uh, lesson on sleeping. I guess uh, all of us in this room are very much interested in uh, why are we tired? What could we do to, to, to sleep better? I have a question regarding the device, which is sometime a little bit of a challenge to wear. You've already mentioned it and we've discussed it before, and, uh, but it's worth it. I think it's worth it. It's helping already. I have a question regarding the frequency of usage. Should this become a day-to-day -day hygienic measure? We should wear that all the time, measure our sleep all the time, and make sure we get all the data and all the you know, help from that device that we can get? Or is this something we should use on a temporary basis just to analyze uh, what kind of a sleeper we are and get some recommendations and then put it aside and let nature do its job? Well, I, I think uh, most likely it would be something depending, I mean, there will be immediate use, like if you want to improve your sleep with a, a, an acute method, like you, you would go through cognitive behavioral therapy, and at the same time you check you are consolidating your sleep, but you might also want to use it once to check your sleep apnea uh, regularly, so maybe once every year you just wear it and you see if your sleep has changed. Uh, I think the power of longitudinal study is really incredible. But we have done some study, I think you too, no? Uh, where we follow people uh, over years. And in fact, he mentioned this Wisconsin Sleep Court, which was uh, one of the first court where they tried to study sleep year after year. And the sleep of the same person repeated four years after is incredibly similar. I mean, you know, it's, uh, our waves are exactly the same. It's very genetic, very personalized. So if there's a change, we can detect it much more through this longitudinal study. But in my opinion, it will be more like you use it for very specialized, uh, you know, uh, one-time use, like improving your sleep through cognitive behavioral therapy, 
and then some monitoring occasionally to check your brain health. But that's just a guess. I mean, I'm, I'm not, uh, I mean, I don't know if other people have different opinion. I think measuring it every day may not be necessary. Unless it's a question. that you can improve. Uh, uh, restless leg syndrome, RLS, is a cause of insomnia in about 15% of the population of the world over 50 years of age, restless leg syndrome. My question is, do you think the headband will be able to detect the signals that the brain sends to the muscles of the legs in order to correct it with the vibration or with the impulse that you send in the brain to go to the area of the brain which, is, which control this movement of the legs? It's in fact a small Parkinson disease. Do you think there is a future for the band headband to detect the signal and correct it. So I'm not sure <laughs> that there could be. A, so what, what is disturbing is that sometimes the leg movement occurs before the awakening, sometimes, sometimes after. So I think we need more to, to study this phenomenon much more in order to be able to detect the, the brain wave that could generate that. But probably Emmanuel has a better answer for that. I, I, <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but I, I, I wanted to point out one thing that I think is exciting in general with this idea of devices, is indeed we have the possibility of immediately acting on whatever is happening. So for example, even sleep apnea, I mean, I think uh, Raphael mentioned very briefly that there are different types of sleep apnea. There are sleep apnea where you stop breathing and your oxygen drops. There are sleep apnea where you wake up immediately and they may have different consequences. And I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting it should be done, but there have been, you know, you could imagine that someone that has sleep apnea that, uh, for example, uh, like oxygen drops because they are too long, you could disturb, you know, kind of wake them up and maybe it makes them a little more tired, but it's less bad for their health. And in other people, it's more helpful to uh, uh, do something different, like putting some stimulation of sleep so that they actually, uh, you know, they don't wake up as much because they are too sensitive as soon as they start to have discomfort in their throat. Some people just wake up by snoring themselves awake. And for leg movements, it'll be the same thing. We know so little, there might be ways to condition uh, the body to react differently. But I mean, I, I don't think we have any way of doing these experiments now because there is no way to detect the leg movement and do something about it. So it's just an entire field of research where you have this immediately immediate biofeedback that was just not even conceivable uh, a few years ago. So it's not a, an answer because I don't know what we would do, but I think conceptually that's exactly the direction of a lot of research should go. The ability to have immediate feedback to sleep. I don't know if you no, no, I, I completely agree. I, I mean, I think you raise an extremely important point. And with continuous monitoring, you have the potential later on of picking up an abnormality in brain activity and then potentially correcting it. That we don't have that at the moment, but I think we are shuffling towards it. And I think, you know, very excitingly. Hello. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, I'd like to use the opportunity of having uh, you guys, well-known uh, sleep experts in front of us to ask you a question about uh, deep sleep waves. So we are talking a lot about uh, deep sleep. And uh, I have a question about what do you think uh, delta waves uh, are for in the brain? What's their role in the brain? Thank you. Uh, so I think there's a lot of discussion um, about various components of, 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 of the EEG. Um, certainly, the data that I'm fairly convinced about is that slow wave sleep has been associated with memory consolidation. Uh, and certainly, if you disrupt slow wave sleep, then memory consolidation and cognition are also disrupted in the individual. So it's correlative data, uh, but I think uh, I'm pretty convinced that deep sleep, slow wave sleep, is associated with memory consolidation at some level. Yes, when, what we also know is that deep slow wave sleep occurs locally in brain regions that are the most used during the day. So if you, for example, stimulate the hand for hours and hours during the day, 
the region, the frontal cortex that really stimulates the end, is going to have more slow wave sleep in some kind of form of restoration. So there's very strong, we know also that you know, certain species sleep only on one side of the brain with their slow wave sleep and then the other. So we know that it's a form of restoration probably of the cortex, but is that exactly the slow waves that restore or is it something else that's reflected by slow wave? That's right now we don't really know because we don't have many ways of creating slow waves. And of course, you know, I, I, the experiments with sound stimulation and creating this kind of slow waves is a step in that direction. Uh, I, I don't think we really know the full answer of how much restoration this is going to produce. There is some evidence that it could improve memory uh, to do this kind of manipulation, but uh, in terms of feeling more rested, or I don't think we know yet. And we don't even know if it's going to be strong enough. But there's so many other possibilities in that direction. We are just, uh, as he said, I like it shuffling in the direction. <laughs> Some interesting new data is suggesting that exercise, uh, both in, in animal models and in humans, can actually produce slow wave sleep in certain areas of the brain. And, and what the consequences of that slow wave sleep during exercise um, uh, are doing, we, we don't know. Uh, so, so I think it's there's some, again, we can go forward. Now we've got the ability to measure these um, different states of sleep in the field, we can start to address some of those key questions. You have also other studies and results about the fact that people that are sleep deprived are sleeping a very short amount of time, then with the sleep pressure, they're going to go into deep sleep much faster. Uh, so that's, that's why, we, why it's such a, an important idea and I think a very interesting topic is when we launched the company with Quentin, we, like the, we had always uh, almost the same answers to this question. It's a pretty unknown territory, but we, the gut feeling that we have and, and we are not neuroscientists, we are engineers. So this is a different way of, of working and, and believing in things. But um, you have all this correlation between deep sleep and recovery, restoration, memory consolidation. You see there is a true link. Uh, you can't really explain how. And that's why it's so interesting to see that um, we are actually able to do actively something. And we know that we are at the very beginning of the optimization of what we can do. Uh, and because now that we have the technological platform, we have the user's base, we are starting our work on segmentation. We know that, and we have PhD uh, thesis on, on this specific topic and, and different collaboration on this topic, for example, on the elderly or Alzheimer's. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's pretty interesting to see how we can personalize and see a difference between people. Because in addition to maybe helping people recovering better, uh, we will also understand better the underlying mechanism of uh, slow waves. So it's pretty exciting. <laughs> Only dream people. Just uh, one kind of fun question. Sometimes when you fall asleep, you feel like you're, you know, uh, diving in a hole or that there is a lapse of consciousness that is really short and after you wake up. Do you know where is this come from? Is it linked to K-complex, for instance, or? Okay, who has felt that before? So usually 80% of the people raise their hand. So if you have it, it's completely normal. It's called a hypnic jerk. Uh, it's at least some, some feeling that you have that, that you're falling asleep, probably because your muscles are relaxing and you already have some kind of hallucination and you, you associate these two things together. So it's completely normal to have that and it's almost abnormal not to have it. So we can be sure. <laughs> okay. But, but it's not very well known actually, but that's what's very interesting about sleep. It's, there's so many of these questions that, that are often not well known. I'm sure some of you have experienced also sleep paralysis, like you wake up and you can't move for a few seconds and it can be kind of scary. Sometimes it's even difficult to breathe and then you go uh, away, it's usually because you come out of REM sleep when you're usually paralyzed so that you don't act your dreams. Sometimes some people of the remaining paralysis stays for a few seconds and that can be very scary when you don't know what it is especially when you start to dream again and so there are a lot of experiences that are on the border of normal and pathological as well uh, sleep is a big uh, mis there's a lot of things happening in sleep 
clearly the idea that sleep, nothing happened in sleep is, could, is really wrong. And it's worth emphasizing, this is, although we've, we've known about sleep forever, um, it's only been vaguely respectable to, to measure and, and study sleep um, over the past 50 years or so. Um, and, and it's worth emphasizing that in a five-year training, um, most medical doctors will have one lecture on sleep. Um, it's barely taught at all. And it's been estimated for general practitioners 30% of the problems they will see in their patients are either directly or indirectly related to sleep. And general practitioners have essentially no knowledge of the biology and the importance of sleep. And, and, and we've got to change that understanding. Especially for insomnia, I think this is very, very crucial. Right now, most of the doctors don't have so much time to, to assess the, the sleep complaints and they just provide a medication. And I think this is a very bad habit that should be changed. And I'm sure dream and the CBD that could be associated with the dream could, could change this paradigm and hopefully uh, help people to improve their sleep without taking so many medications. Okay, thank you so much. Emmanuel, Raphael, Russell, Hugo.